Good evening, you're watching Think Tech Asia, and I'm your host, David Day. You know, in the recent uh, weeks, Indonesia has undergone a bitter divisive election, and there is uh, a, a transition of power underway uh, that, that poses all kinds of interesting ramifications, not only for the future of that country, its uh, relations with the United States, but also for business. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, about two months ago, Hawaii entered into a very interesting sister state relationship with the island of Bali in Indonesia. And we, what we want to do with this program is take a look at the ramifications of these two events and tie them together. And to help us do this, we have a member of the board of directors of the Hawaii Indonesia Chamber of Commerce, a former executive with the United Nations and World Bank, Dr. Rani Arikaria. And Rani, nice to have you on the show with us. Glad to be here, David. Uh, for those of you who do not know, uh, uh, Dr. Arikaria's uh, official title is he has been designated by the Governor Abercrombie, the governor of the state of Hawaii, for those of you not from Hawaii, as Hawaii's uh, ambassador to, uh, to, to, to Bali. And uh, he has uh, performed that task uh, exceptionally well. And we'll get into that later on in the program here. But uh, I'm going to call you Ronnie rather than Ambassador Arikaria. Is, is that okay? <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Well, you know, let's, um, maybe the place for us to begin, uh, Ronnie, let's, let's kind of talk about the big picture here. Uh, uh, if, we, if we start from kind of the, the, the low point in recent years, uh, the, the collapse of the Thai bot, the Asian financial crisis, and then the implosion of the Suharto regime, that's from 1990, 1997, 1998. If we fast forward the uh, DVD, uh, we get a, a, a series of, 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 of elections, uh, and uh, ultimately we get the, the current president of Indonesia, uh, SBY, and, uh, and uh, SBY has served out his two full terms, and Indonesia has now gone through a, uh, a, a very interesting election, and uh, it looks like with a substantial majority, uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Joko Widodo has been elected as the new leader in Indonesia. And ladies and gentlemen, remember always that Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world by population. And uh, it is a Muslim majority country, country. And the important word in that sentence is majority. So a very significant player in Southeast Asia. Uh, and so, Ronnie, you were in Indonesia during the campaign and, and election period. Uh, what strikes you as kind of the, 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 the interesting piece of this whole, this whole phenomenon? David, this is a very uh, interesting campaign and also presidential election that I think the country has not seen it before. Hold, let me interrupt you for one second here, because I think, I think uh, just hold that thought. Uh, the reason I want to interrupt you, uh, Ronnie, is that it, it, it's, it's hard to, to, uh, to understate, really, the significance of this election for, for Indonesia, uh, a country with tremendous uh, governance challenges and so forth. And uh, I just want the audience to, to visualize. This is a this is a country that is uh, what, Ronnie, seventeen thousand something islands. Yes. Seven, and and how many time zones? <laughs> Three times. Okay. Uh, with that as kind of as the background, I, I apologize for the interruption. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, David, uh, it is a very unusual uh, campaign in that uh, for many. Uh, Indonesian, this is perhaps the first that you see a high level of personal commitment and personal involvement uh, in the campaign process. It's not only the outcome that is uh, interesting, 70% uh, turnout, 
But more important is the process, the, the, the type of campaigning, how people are involved in heated debates. Uh, it's not only the purview of the uh, media, pundit, the political uh, uh, gurus, uh, but also taxi drivers, uh, hairstylists, uh, waiters, uh, housewives even. They are all involved very, very uh, uh, in heated de debates and they are involved as volunteers. This is first, for, uh, perhaps the first time uh, in Indonesian presidential election where you have volunteers. Uh, they're using crowdsourcing. They're getting, you know, testimonies from people who knows him, from the, from the masses. Uh, funding, sure there are some money politics, but also uh, instead of uh, the candidates paying for uh, the campaign uh, workers, the campaign workers are themselves well, are donating money for the, Ronnie, for the is, campaign. Is that, is that because the this is what we're seeing is a, a, a new fledgling democracy that is coming alive, that people are excited because it's new, or, or, or is it because the country is on a, on a knife edge of, of, uh, of development and could go one way or the other? What's the reason for all this? One of the candidates resonates with, uh, with the masses. Uh, he is a populist, uh, communicate well with the public, uh, the other one is sort of a controversial figure, but uh, again, uh, championed by some group of people who are basically more educated and uh, the urban population, more uh, higher uh, socioeconomic uh, status, and you can see the result of the election. Well, before we do that, yeah. let's hold the surprise yes. now. Let's, let's for, for folks in the audience who maybe don't know, let's, let's show them, uh, ask our engineers to help us with... Uh, uh, Visual number 1A, if we could do that, and, and uh, we'll sh show you the two candidates, and then Ronnie, if you could identify uh, what we've got here. So we have the one uh, on the left, of course, the one with the, with the head is the General uh, Prabowo, uh, and on the left is the populist uh, candidate, uh, Jokowi, Jokowi Dodo, nicknamed by Jokowi, uh, is a common name. Let's go to photograph number two, if we could, and uh, how about tell us a little bit about uh, General Prabowo uh, Subianto? Well, General Prabowo uh, came from a very uh, privileged uh, family. His uh, father is the well-known economist, uh, Sumitro, and uh, he has a very important, uh, of course, connection in the whole uh, Indonesian society, but more interestingly is uh, his background. He himself is a Muslim, but his family are Christian. His brother, who is a wealthy businessman, a very successful businessman, one of the top uh, tycoons in, in the country. He, he, he is the former son-in-law of, of the, Suharto, uh, Suharto the yes. former dictator. That's okay, right. So he's, right. he's tied in with the old guard, the oligarchy, the, the, uh, I hate to use the word, but, but, but we would say the ruling class of Indonesia, yes? Yes, the ruling class, but also um, he came from a very, very uh, highly educated and well-known family himself. Okay. In addition to marrying, of course, the daughter of uh, the former president. But he has lived overseas most okay. of his time, very urbane and uh, very um, uh, much uh, connected to the outside world as well. And I think uh, what's interesting to see is this, his background. His brother is a Christian, his uh, sister is a Catholic, but he himself is a Muslim. And also, he is uh, uh, very, very decisive in many of his decisions that he made when he was uh, a general. Let's, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we want you now to, to get a feel for the, the uh, uh, putative winner of the election, uh, Jokowi. And so, uh, Control Room, if you could show us uh, photos three, four, and five in sequence. And, and uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, Jokowi? Jokowi, as his, is known by the public, uh, is a very, very uh, famous mayor of a small city or medium-sized city in central Java, Solo, and he became the governor of uh, Jakarta. Uh, very good record when it comes to problem solving, and he is uh, liked by many people because he is a, uh, a problem solver. He goes to the... Uh, 
to the field. Okay. And he spent most of his time in the field in San Francisco office. So he's not from the traditional ruling class, the oligarchy. He, he's, uh, he's uh, yes. what would you say? To, he's a man of the people? Well, Something he's, like that? he's a man of the people. Uh, he is a person who uh, likes to listen and very, very uh, participatory oriented and very much open, very transparent. That's why I think the public likes him. This election put uh, Jokowi ahead by some six percentage points. Uh, he has been declared the winner. Uh, is that the end of the story? Done? He will no. take over in October? No. It's a still a long story and long road, I think, because it has to go to the uh, Constitutional Court because uh, General uh, Prabowo has not accepted the uh, election result, the official election result. He has uh, filed the uh, the protest, and the court will decide. And I think decision will be uh, will need to be made by uh, August 31st. Now, we don't know the result. At the moment, it's still uh, liquid. Anything can happen. But uh, even if Jokowi uh, managed to get the presidency, I think there are a lot of challenges ahead of him. Well, let's, you know, there, there is uh, this enthusiasm side, a uh, uh, major change for Indonesia, a change of direction, uh, change of the political ruling class. Uh, but before we get to that, you know, I, I, I'm very interested in your thoughts on what you see uh, Jokowi's challenges really are, are, are likely to be. Uh, and, uh, let's address those first. Okay. What do you see? Well, as you know, Jokowi is the new breed of leaders uh, uh, in Indonesia. Uh, there are people like that now coming up, the young, bright, but also very, very much uh, populist-oriented. And, and he, ran a, he, yeah. ran, a grassroots he ran a grassroots campaign. He ran a grassroots campaign, and you can see the mayor of uh, uh, Bandung, for instance, Ridwan. Uh, and he is uh, also a similar uh, character, having similar characteristic as uh, uh, Jokowi. The mayor of Bogor, uh, Bima Arya, is another one. The mayor of Surabaya. So there are new leaders, new cadres of people who are coming up with that kind of personality. Who are close to the people, uh, uh, very, very much uh, problem oriented, problem solving oriented, and and uh, willing to uh, dirty their, their hand. They're not, they not sitting in their offices like most bureaucrats do. Where did Jokowi get his funding? Jokowi, as I mentioned earlier, uh, of course he gets some funding also from some of his supporters, but a lot of money coming also from the grassroots, as I said, crowdfunding. His crowdfunding. Crowdfunding. Okay. Not only crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing is another Silicon Valley jargon in which the people who are working in the field themselves are doing the campaign. But is and that, is it, so what's new about that? Is that different? No, Something it's, new? It's, it's basically very much spontaneous. It's done by various people at the, 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 the uh, grassroots level. And this is where, why then there are so much debate among people, among the common man. They are, f they are really debating about the presidency. Because of this kind of personal involvement, it's not only they're going to the poll and vote, but way before the voting, they are already active. And the grassroots level, the traditional media, as well as the social media. You know, we, uh, we're gonna go to a break in just a moment. I want you to hold that thought. And when we come back after the break, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to, continue to talk with uh, Dr. Rani Adhikaria about the, the, the challenges of governance that uh, Jokowi will face, assuming that, that this election goes through uh, smoothly, the uh, protest by General Prabowo is, is handled, uh, and then we'll look at, at some of his, his strengths and his strong points and how they impact uh, the direction of the country and uh, business and business opportunities mm -hmm. before we get into the whole your ambassadorial work as uh, with uh, the state mm -hmm. of Hawaii and the island of Bali. Uh, so stay with us. I'll see you on the other side of the break.
Aloha, this is Kelee Akina. It's my privilege to be the host of Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako, what does that mean? Well, many people have heard of a pule kako, let's pray together. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Let's work together to build a better economy, government, and society. And every week, Monday from 2 to 3 o'clock, you will see movers and shakers and other people who are working together to build a better economy, government, and society. Again, I'm Kili'i Akina on the Ehana Kako weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Aloha. See you here Mondays 2 to 3. We're back. You're watching Think Tech Asia, and our program this evening is all about the big changes that uh, may be taking place in Indonesia in the months and years to come. And our special guest is Dr. Rani Adhikarya, uh, who is a member of the Board of Directors of the Hawaii Indonesia Chamber of Commerce. He's also a former United Nations and World Bank executive. And uh, if you just joined us, uh, Right before the break, uh, Ronnie was talking about, we were talking about the, some of the challenges that, uh, the, the, uh, that Jokowi uh, is likely to face. Uh, and uh, uh, how does his 6% uh, lead in the election translate into to, uh, a parliamentary majority? Does, is, does that make it easy for him? To, to rule? No, this is, David, this is the issue that is really uh, uh, very, very uh, difficult to, uh, to analyze because, you know, uh, many people believe that Jokowi has the integrity, high integrity, he is honest, right, uh, right. he is likable, but the question in the mind of many people still is that, is it enough to be a statesman? Is it enough? To govern, is it enough to be the leader of a country like Indonesia, the four, as you said, the fourth largest uh, country, and having uh, important role in APEC and uh, the G20 and the D8, right. the uh, Organization of Islamic State, uh, ASEAN Community 2015, and also the, the, the historical uh, yes. leadership in Indonesia has always exactly. been strongmen. Exactly. So. Now, the, the problem is now how does he govern? Can he govern? Even with six point percentage lead in the popular vote. But if you look at the coalition that he has established compared to the coalition that Prabowo has established, can we show the chart? All right, let's the, do uh, that. Yeah, uh, let's, let's take a look the at chart. that. chart? Yeah, that would be... Uh, Control room. If we could, we could bring up that would be numbers. There we go. Okay. Okay. If Explain you, this. If now. you s look at the uh, percent of the vote, Jokowi won by six percent. Can we see the com complete picture? Okay. Um, Fifty-three percent against forty-six percent of the percent of popular vote. Right. But if you look at the legislative seats based on the coalition government that each of them has established, you see a very, very different picture. And Jokowi has only 37% well, in, this, in the legislature. In this new democracy, does the legis is the legislative power important? Oh, yes. How can you get uh, budget approved? How can you get uh, new policies approved? You know, a lot of uh, problem there. So like this, they, right. in, in okay. the, uh, like in, we have in, in the, the U.S. Washington here. Okay, so that 37.1 percent, right? that is a big problem. That's a big problem. If right? I look over on the Probowo side there, it, it's uh, legislative seats. 63 percent. 63 percent. Right. And what is interesting is here, the vice president of Jokowi, right, okay. Yusuf Kala, who used to be vice president in the SBJ government before, is from Golkar, okay, the Golongan Golkar Karya party, party okay. which is officially aligning itself with the Prabowo group. Well, will they shift? This is the big question. If and when they shift, then it is possible that at least you have, you add that how many percent there, 16.3% uh, plus 37%, still you get about 50... You get a split. Split. It's still there. It's not good enough. 
to get a majority. Wow. So you still wow. need to have somebody else. Maybe it is the PD, that's the Democratic Party, if the party of the present president. The party of the present president, of course, Hatta Rajasa is the in-law. Uh, okay. <laughs> of, uh, uh, no, uh, 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 sorry. Uh, so Hatta Rajasa is on the other side. And Golkar is also on the other side. If Golkar move, you get 50%. Hopefully, Democratic Party will also split. Now, the question is, will it happen? The next, the next issue, as far as the we, challenges... We can take that photo down now. Yeah. yeah. Is the concern of many people about how much influence has Jokowi in terms of governing vis-a-vis -vis the PDEP, the party that nominates him. So As this is know, the party was governed by? By Megawati Sukarnaputri, former president and former, uh, and also the daughter of the former, the first president, Sukarno. So she's, she's kind of the kingmaker, she right? She is the kingmaker. But what is interesting is that she has a daughter who has also political ambition, Puan Maharani. Now, Puan Maharani uh, is sort of the heir of the uh, Sukarno dynasty. And there's going to be a problem also there. To what extent can Jokowi neutralize her? Uh, he has managed to sort of uh, neutralize her. Puan wanted to be the vice president. Jokowi managed to say no. He instead chose Yusuf Kala, who is a okay. very seasoned, you know, politician and a uh, former vice president and also uh, she wanted to be the uh, campaign uh, manager that was also fatal so so, so those two attempts at, at major so positions far, in Jokowi's campaign so he far, said no so far so good now the next test case is in the appointment of cabinet minister that is the next next thing that I'm looking at okay what so, so for our audience uh, Ronnie, what is the, the problem with the influence of Megawati over Jokowi in terms of, of, of appointment? Why, why is this a problem? Well, uh, it's a matter of credibility. It's a matter of how it is perceived by the public. And also, there are a lot of transactional politics later on when it comes to uh, appointment of cabinet minister, for instance, okay. important people. To what extent? can Jokowi manage to get his the people he wants, the real professional, the people who are competent okay. as first of all the, okay. the, 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 the bureaucrats or you know the uh, the friends of uh, whoever. So the, right? the, the real issue is whether or not once he's elected, once he's sworn in, whether Jokowi will be his own man, stand on his own rock, or whether he will be under the influence of the grand dame of the party, Megawati. That's right. That's the issue. That's right. Let's, you know, we have a, a, a large business audience here that, that are watching this program, and, and I'm sure they're saying, well, what is this election? How, how could it impact me or my business? And so let me ask you, the, let me come at it this way. How, I mean, I'm asking you to crystal ball this a little bit, but how do you see foreign direct investment in Indonesia, impacted by this election, with Jokowi as the new the new leader. Yes, well, David, we uh, we do not quite know how policy will change until we know who will be appointed in the as cabinet minister and and to what extent uh, Jokowi will have a majority in the in the parliament. Because then we know whether whether policy changes, economic policy changes, and public policy will change. But to be on the safe side, if you ask me my, uh, my take about foreign investment, I would say avoid the sensitive areas that many people in Indonesia already think that it is not for foreign investment, and that is basically the area of natural resources. Okay, so this is a okay. major business strategy tip for those of you in the business community. And what Dr. Arikari is saying is 
try to stay away from areas that involve natural resources and what else? What, natural what? resources mean mining, uh, uh, minerals. So uh, if you're in that sorts. business already, your advice well, is to are, yeah, yes, hold yes, on, yes, hold so on. There are a lot of uh, talk about uh, canceling or, or uh, reissuing the, the even the con present contract about the, uh, 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 those big companies uh, in this okay. area. Okay? But, uh, but, but aside from the, those areas, then uh, what? I would say go into areas where uh, where it is safe. For instance, in the area of uh, services, financial services. Okay. Indonesia, uh, some of the people there already having a uh, rise in their income, right? The uh, rising middle class. Uh, middle class okay. is rising, and people are having uh, extra money to invest. So I think. Companies like insurance companies, banking, uh, capital market uh, type of companies uh, should be doing well there. Another area that is needed in Indonesia right now is infrastructure development. Roads, uh, rap mass, uh, mass rapid transport system, uh, airport construction, uh, seaport, etc. These are the kind of, of uh, project that will need to be to be developed uh, okay. in, in, the, in the near future. Then the area of uh, leisure industry, and this is again uh, leisure and what we call creative, creative economy industry, where uh, media, you have, film, uh, that kind of thing. Well, is uh, for instance uh, a fitness industry, sports industry, okay. entertainment industry, uh, tourism uh, industry. Uh, recreation uh, type of industry. These are the area where I think the rising uh, middle class will spend their money. In. Then we have also the area of uh, telecom and mobile technology, which is a very, very big and fast moving technology. Uh, for a country like Indonesia, a lot needs to be done in improving the telecommunication okay. infrastructure. So this is a big, big area for investment in, in this. Not only the, the hardware, but also the developing the apps, the programming, etc. So more the software as well as the, the hardware in this area. Then, of course, in the two other areas that everybody's talking about these days, green technology, you know, we don't need to talk uh, again okay. about that. Uh, climate change and uh, waste management, uh, etc. But the most important new area is the what we call the blue technology. Okay, I'm going to ask you to mm. hold on that mm. till we get to talk a little bit more about Hawaii. And before we do that, kind of uh, ending this conversation having to do with foreign direct investment and the economy, I'm going to put up a, a, a photo for you, sure. and I want I want you to react to this and. Uh, Mr. Producer, let's take a look at uh, visual number number eight, if we could, here. Uh, for those of you who have not followed the, the developments of the, uh, uh, the Dow and the Jakarta Stock Exchange, uh, Ronnie, why don't you explain what we're looking at here and why is this interesting? Well, as you know, the uh, stock market in many parts of the world, including uh, in Wall Street, is all-time high, uh, except for today. <laughs> it dropped over 300 <laughs> points. But uh, it's been going up very, very uh, uh, rapidly. But if you compare to countries like Indonesia, the rise is even much higher. If you can see in the last five years, it went up about 100 Twenty percent, right? Yeah. No, no. The Jakarta Stock yeah. Exchange, the composite index, it's is the, the line one. on the top. Yeah, on the, the, the top. blue line. Yes. Right. And you can see how it beats uh, the uh, cons consistently. Uh, consistently in the last five years. Now, why is it? Well, first of all, of course, there's also foreign money, but also there are a lot of uh, people in Indonesia now have excess uh, money, have saving, and what do they do? Uh, the saving, yeah, is interesting to have uh, a five percent or six percent net uh, interest rate f in saving, but if you can make 30% a year, why not, right? Mutual funds and uh, equities in Jakarta, stock exchange is, is booming. So we've got a, a strong economy here to, that uh, has uh, interesting possibilities for business. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go to a break. We're having a conversation with Dr. Rani Adhikarya. 
here, a former executive with the United Nations and the World Bank, an expert on Indonesia. And we can, when we come back after the break, we're going to be talking about uh, Ronnie's involvement in the Bali-Hawaii sister state relationship and what that means for business. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll do that when we come back after the break. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard, and I host the show Center Stage on the Think Tech Hawaii digital series right here every Wednesday from 2 to 3 Hawaii time. I would really love to have you watch the show and see what we do here. I talk with some of the most amazing people, artists, most of them, all of them involved in some sort of artistic process. And our goal here on the show is to dig into that artistic process, and you would not believe what some people say what some people do, what people go through to express. And these are people who have to express somehow, and I find that infinitely interesting. Not only that they have to express, but how they end up doing it. I really hope that you will watch the show and enjoy talking with some of these people the same way that I do. Thanks, and I hope to see you soon on Center Stage on the Think Tech Hawaii Digital Series, Wednesdays from 2 to 3. See you soon. We're back, you're watching Think Tech Asia, and our program this evening is all about the new Indonesia and its big changes. Our special guest is Dr. Rani Adhikaria, and uh, as we moving through this program, Rani, uh, I want to talk about uh, something that's, uh, I know, very dear to your heart, and that's the whole relationship that has evolved in a sister state relationship between the state of Hawaii and the island of Bali, which you have been intimately involved in. Um, and, uh, and in fact, uh, the governor of the state of Hawaii has uh, officially designated you as, <laughs> as the emissary, uh, uh, you know, kind of an unofficial citizen ambassador from the state of Hawaii to the governor of Bali. And uh, uh, before we start here, uh, for those of you who don't know about this, um, Let's take a look, uh, control them if we could, at uh, photograph number nine. Uh, and this is where it all started here. Uh, photograph number nine is in the capital. Uh, this is the Consul General Hadi Martono. Hadi Martono. And uh, Governor Abercrombie, State of Hawaii, in the formal signing. Uh, you were here for that? Yes. As the ink went on the paper of a, a, a new relationship between Indonesia and uh, sp Bali. Sp specifically the island of Bali. So take us now, uh, from that signing ceremony, you were designated by the governor as the official emissary to, from the governor of Hawaii to the governor of Bali. Uh, and uh, uh, tell us about, in, in kind of a short fashion, uh, some photos that kind of illustrate uh, what, we, what, what you did there. And so, uh, control room if you could kind of help us with these visuals that'd be great so you you go escorted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs yes uh, after the signing of the memorandum of understanding by governor of Hawaii uh, I was asked by the government to uh, personally deliver a message and in a letter so I personally hand carry the letter to uh, Indonesia to Bali but the arrangement uh, surprisingly, was done by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, which is very, very uh, interesting. And this is uh, a photo where I met uh, and had a meeting with the governor of Bali, Mangku Pastika, uh, and his senior staff uh, at his office in Bali. And I uh, presented him with a lay, of course. That's, that's a lay he's working <laughs> on. Okay. Yes. okay, very and good. And also the uh, special message and letter uh, from the governor and the governor of Bali appreciated it very much and conveyed uh, uh, that he will, uh, of course, support this. Uh, Let's go to the next picture yes. if we could. Uh, there we go. And he uh, assured that uh, his office and himself uh, personally will uh, uh, collaborate and facilitate whatever programs, collaborative program that Bali and Hawaii. Uh, will have that will benefit uh, both the Balinese and the Hawaiian uh, population. Okay, let's go to the next picture. 
And uh, this, uh, you know, I, I particularly enjoy this picture. Uh, what is it that you're, tell our audience, what is it that you're sharing with uh, Governor Pastica? Well, there are many things. Of course, uh, one is uh, to, uh, to report to him what happened uh, during the signing because he signed a, uh, a month earlier. Right, right. He and, signed first. Yeah, so I reported to him about uh, what happened during the signing and also presented him with a, with a letter. And then we discuss already about what needs to be done. What are the steps uh, for follow-up action? So you actually, and this is photograph number D here, you actually had a, a significant working sit-down session. Is that what we're looking yes. at here? We had a meeting of about 45 to 50 minutes, which is very rare. Usually this is only a courtesy call for 5-10 minutes to say, you know, welcome and uh, thank you, etc. But this... Uh, uh, became a working meeting and substantive issues were discussed with the government but also with the doers. I mean the, the people, uh, the senior staff, we need to implement it. And immediately, three days after that, the secretary of the province established the Bali Coordinating Committee which needs to basically the implementing arm that will, uh, that will be talking to our also Hawaii Coordinating Committee. Okay, so for purposes of our audience, is it, is it, uh, and, uh, uh, is it, is it fair to say that, that the, the, the senior leadership on the island of Bali is, is, is supportive of this uh, relationship? Are they enthusiastic about it? Yes, uh, they are. Uh, the fact that I was escorted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and I had a long meeting, plus also immediately after that, I had meetings with the Bali Chamber of Commerce and Industry with the chairperson and top management, also with the Bali Tourism Board Chair and also the Association of Travel Agencies and Tours of Bali. So I met with uh, important and high-level people whom usually is very difficult to have a meeting with. So uh, we're going to get, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in a moment, we're going to get to the business ramifications of this sister state relationship with Bali and Dr. Arikaria's uh, uh, tips for Hawaii business. Uh, but before we do that, you, you, you had these series of meetings on the island of Bali, and then you, you returned to Jakarta, as I understand correct. it. Correct. And uh, if we could show the, uh, the audience uh, photograph number E, if we could, Ambassador. here. Um, uh, how about identify for people in the audience who don't know, who are these two people that are with you? Well, uh, Who's the this tall is guy? the U.S. Ambassador, okay. uh, His Excellency Robert Blake. And uh, the lady uh, in the middle is the commercial uh, attache, commercial officer of the uh, U.S. Uh, Commerce uh, Commercial Office. What, what's the uh, point of, what, what, what well, was this meeting we, about? Uh, the, the ambassador was very, very enthusiastic about this uh, man or understanding of the Bali Hawaii sister state. And he uh, had a reception, a dinner reception in the house, inviting business leaders of Jakarta and announced this uh, Bali-Hawaii sister state partnership in front of the media. Interesting, very interesting. Let me ask you to, let me go back to the photograph just for one more second if we could. This lady that's in the middle uh, from the U.S. Commercial yes. Service, do you Max. recall her Margaret, name? yes. Margaret, what is her name? Uh, Margaret uh, Sue. Sue. Yeah. Uh, U.S. Commercial Service. Yes, and, office. And, yeah. and, and the U.S. Commercial Service will be an important link for Hawaii business in tying into business in Bali, and that's why uh, she's important, although she may have moved on to another yeah. post by now. But her office will continue, and also uh, we have also touched base with the uh, uh, Consulate General uh, in Surabaya, who will be also uh, working with us closely. This is the U.S. Consul General. Yes, and U.S. The, Consul General. Okay. So let's now, uh, you know, we, we started this program, Ronnie, with the kind of the big picture. We have the, this, this bitterly fought, divisive election. Uh, we now have new leadership, it looks like, coming on uh, in Indonesia with, with challenges. Uh, very briefly, I'd like you to, to maybe to, let's talk to the, to the Hawaii business people that are watching this show. And what are the opportunities, just focusing on Bali? Now, I realize yeah. that the opportunities for Indonesia at large are, are substantial and perhaps different. 
but in focusing on business opportunities that you see in Bali for, for our Hawaii business, let's talk about that now. Right. David, when I met with our counterparts, our friends in Bali and Indonesia, uh, there are basically uh, two or three important uh, uh, strategy that, that came out. One is that in order to have a good partnership between two places like Bali and Hawaii, what we need to do is identify the niche. Okay. What okay. is best right. of what Bali can offer, what is best that uh, Hawaii can offer, and try to see if there is a need, a matching need. Okay. In doing any partnership and any programs that other places in Indonesia or in, in Asia or in, in, in the mainland can do. So having said that, of course, there are two or three things that came out. One is that, one is tourism. But tourism that is sustainable, tourism that does not create pollution, create traffic jam, and that will benefit not only the big guys, but also the middle, small and middle scale entrepreneurs. All right, so you narrow the gap between the rich, the capital, you know, money and the uh, the smaller uh, uh, handicraftsmen, etc. So clearly, right. what you're saying is there's some expertise here in Hawaii that can oh, yes. that, that can help in Bali. Exactly. In Bali. Okay. The what next else? the next thing is that Bali and uh, Hawaii has a lot of things in common. One is culture, the cultural uh, preservation that that is that is important, cultural uh, and heritage preservation. The other thing that's important is, as I mentioned earlier, about blue technology. Uh, both are islands, and therefore, there are problems about coastal deterioration, okay. uh, beach safety, beach maintenance, uh, anything has to do with ocean-based resource mining or resource management, so that's resource development, like ocean farming, for, ocean farming, okay. wave technology that you okay. people have been talking that Hawaii may be the first in the, in the United States to do that. Uh, we know also about the, the leisure industry that's related to tourism development. Uh, and that's, for instance, surfing. Uh, All the water sports. Water sports, uh, rafting, uh, diving. Diving is a big business in, in, in Bali or uh, in, uh, in Hawaii. So again, we need to look at these type of... Uh, the wedding uh, business. Comes the down. wedding business, the, the leisure industry. Uh, resort development condominiums, timeshare, those are the kind of thing that the middle income group people in Indonesia and especially in Bali are interested in working and learning from each other as from, from, from Hawaii, for instance. Okay, I'm going to shift topics on you yeah. now because we just have about a minute left. And uh, earlier in the program, you talked about some of the, the, the very difficult challenges that uh, the, the president-elect Jokowi will face. Um, and I'd like to just what are some of his his real strengths that perhaps we haven't addressed? Where, where has he got, uh, where would we underestimate him? Where, where is the positive side of, of, of this new leadership coming in? Well, I think one is uh, openness and transparency, uh, allowing more participation from civil society, from uh, various groups of people who uh, have not been given the chance in the past to uh, contribute to the development of the country. Uh, I think there is also an opportunity for uh, new areas uh, to be developed. Like uh, he, he is very keen about having uh, uh, to use the new technology. E-governance, he keep on talking about okay. e-governance. Okay. He's talking about uh, getting the young people into the uh, mobile and cloud technology business. Uh, the, the new kind of uh, uh, technology and occupation of the 21st century. And I think this is the promising, uh, promising part. Many people have doubt whether he is with, he's having that kind of vision, whether, you know, as you know, he, he got most of his votes from the rural areas and from the lower, lower, uh, classes. lower uh, socioeconomic group. And and also not from the young people. The young people are voting for Prabowo. Now he needs to get those people to support him, to support him in the new push towards the ICT and new technology for development. Okay, that's a big challenge, big change. 
and we'll be watching Indonesia very closely. And uh, Dr. Rani Arikaria, we'd like to thank you for joining us uh, for this uh, wonderful program. And we wish uh, President-elect uh, Joko Widodo the very best of luck with a huge series of challenges coming up. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're through. Good night. Have a safe drive home. Thank you.